simply assume that these were like the hedges in a suburban backyard, four or five feet tall, maybe. But these ancient hedges, dating back nearly 2,000 years, are 20 to 30 feet tall and extremely thick. They can't be climbed, tanks can't maneuver through them safely, and explosives would give away a unit's position. The hedgerow country in Normandy threatens to completely undermine the momentum that the Allies need to build up. The American army is a mechanized army, and you can't move tanks and trucks very quickly uh, through uh, hedgerows that are enormously thick. The Allies' momentum stops dead in its tracks. 40 days pass, and they have only reached their day five objectives. Casualties mount to more than 78,000, and the entire invasion is in jeopardy. But the solution on how to escape this enormous maze lies in the pages of Sun Tzu's Art of War. Sun Tzu says, make your enemy prepare on his left, and he will be weak on his right. In Normandy, France, the Allies are getting pummeled in the hedgerows of the Bocage country, terrain perfectly suited for German ambushes and snipers. The Germans have a word for close order combat in terrain that's very complex and closed. It's called Rattenkrieg. It means literally the war of the rats. It means, in essence, that warfare gets reduced to almost individual combat, one or two men against one or two men, because uh, the terrain, in this case the hedgerows, won't allow you to maneuver, won't allow you to bring your, your technological advances of artillery, air power, mobility to tanks uh, to bear. So the war uh, in the hedgerows was, was a terrible war. It was up close and personal. But perhaps what's most deadly in the hedgerows are the German panzer tanks prowling the maze. The British actually had a pamphlet on how to hunt tanks. They would send out specialized teams of individuals with bazookas or piets, as the British and the Canadian armies call them, in order to actually hunt down tanks and uh, take them out. And the, uh, the manual actually likens it to big game hunting, where you're out stalking a, a tiger or an elephant and trying to take it down. Eventually, the Allies devise a Sun Tzu-inspired strategy to help free themselves from the carnage of the Bocage country. The plan is to lure most of the German forces fighting at the Bocage to the city of Caen, so a weakened force is left behind. Primarily because Caen had airfields and it was closest to Paris, and so the Germans were fairly sure that we would attack through Caen. The Allied plan begins with Operation Goodwood, a blistering barrage of air power against the city of Caen. The Germans take the bait and move many of their panzer tank divisions away from the Bocage, leaving only one and a half divisions behind to hold back the U.S. forces in the hedgerows. The U.S. immediately takes advantage of the shift and strikes with a withering air attack on the remaining German panzer tank divisions. It's called Operation Cobra. Sun Tzu says is, you must behave like the snake. Why? So that when you uh, attack on the front, the back will reinforce the front. You attack in the rear, the front can reinforce that point, and you attack the middle, both sides will come in. So for Sun Tzu, right, it is really that the enemy attacking you, in your, in your responses, you must be flexible. With nearly all of the German tanks destroyed, US forces are able to punch a hole in the German line with artillery, tanks, and infantry. Finally, after weeks of frustration, the Allies break out of the Bocage. The diversion of Goodwood at Caen and the success of Cobra in the Bocage country changes the strategic equation. The stalled Allied momentum returns with a vengeance. Throughout the Normandy invasion, Sun Tzu's invisible hand guides the Allies to victory through their use of deception, foreknowledge, and a superior command structure 
that motivates the entire army to fight as one. Sun Tzu says, the winning army realizes the conditions for victory first, then fights. The losing army fights first, then seeks victory. The battle between the kingdoms of Wu and Chu rages. Sun Tzu's small Wu force is on death ground. They are surrounded by the army of the Chu Prime Minister, Nang Hua. But Sun Tzu isn't worried. While Nang Hua's army attacks, Sun Tzu's main force is headed to capture the Chu capital of Ying. When Nang Hua realizes that Sun Tzu's main force is bent on the attack on Ying, he has a tough decision to make. Obviously, he wants to kill Sun Tzu. He wants to wipe out this force under Sun Tzu's command. But while he doesn't think the Wu force, the main body, is much of a threat to the Chu capital, he's afraid that the defender of Ying, another general, will win credit for defending the capital against the Wu forces. As a result, he races back to defend Ying. It will be Nanghua's most colossal mistake of the war. Like Nanghua, generals throughout history have charged headlong into battle without having all the information they need. Thousands of years later, in the farmlands of Pennsylvania, another general rushes into battle without knowing what lies ahead. He is Confederate General Robert E. Lee, who some consider the greatest commander in American history. But at Gettysburg, Lee fails to heed Sun Tzu's wisdom and pays a terrible price. Sun Tzu says, no nation has ever benefited from prolonged war. The American Civil War is Sun Tzu's nightmare scenario. A bloody stalemate that will end up costing more than 620,000 lives. By far, the deadliest war in American history. By 1863, it's pretty clear on both sides that this is not going to be the short war everyone thought it was going to be when, at the Battle of Manassas, uh, the ladies and gentlemen drove out of D.C. in their carriages with picnic lunches to observe what they thought would be the first and last battle of the war. Everybody knows now it's going to be a long war. The war affects every American, sometimes in unexpected ways. The Civil War sees the creation of the first American psychiatric hospital at St. Elizabeth's in Washington, D.C., still in operation today. The war between the North and South also affected how Americans receive their mail. A Cleveland postmaster becomes so distraught by the sight of anxious wives and children lining up at his post office that he institutes home delivery for the very first time, though what many homes receive are death notices. The turkey buzzards realized that whenever they saw an army, that sooner or later there would be flesh to eat. And as the armies moved along, they often moved along with hundreds of turkey buzzards overhead, just waiting for the battlefield, waiting for the carnage, waiting for the open wounds, peck out their eyes, and eat the innards as they would any other carrion. An almost a horrific scene, but that's what war is. Uh, pretty horrific in times. Civil War field hospitals are human butcher shops with arms and legs stacked in piles. Some 40,000 amputations are performed on the Union side alone, only 24,000 of them under anesthesia. doctors performed dozens of surgeries without ever washing their hands. It was seven times safer 
to fight through the entire Battle of Gettysburg than it was to be sent to an army hospital. The death rate there was 30 and 40 percent. Taking the limb off was just one, one part of it. Now you had the problem of gangrene, superation, uh, infection, and, and the death rates were just staggeringly high. The American Civil War is a classic example of why Sun Tzu warns against going to war in the first place. But other principles in the art of war will prove instrumental in how the war eventually ends. Sun Tzu says, those skilled in war bring the enemy to the field of battle. They are not brought by him. Pennsylvania, 1863. The Civil War is a bloody stalemate. By the end of June of that year, Confederate General Robert E. Lee boldly moves his army of nearly 60,000 men into Union territory. While most of the battles of the American Civil War have been fought in the South, Lee decides the moment is right to invade Union soil. Lee's plan? destroy as many military posts as possible in Maryland and Pennsylvania while Union armies defend Washington, D.C. One key target is Camp Curtin, outside of Harrisburg, the largest military supply depot in the North. The strategy of Lee's attack on the North is not primarily military, it's primarily political. And he's going to try to essentially uh, to, to defeat Lincoln politically. What he hopes is a massive defeat of the North will encourage people to lose faith in the war. Lee's bold military action to achieve a political victory is more of a go strategy than a chess strategy, exactly the kind of plan Sun Tzu would have admired. But as Lee's main force moves north, a skirmish erupts in Gettysburg between two cavalry units. Confederate General Heath had a division at Cashtown, and he wanted to move over to Gettysburg in order to get some shoes that were in a factory there. Uh, that was the only reason he went. Uh, he, and in, in this fashion, he, he moved without any understanding of what lay ahead of him, and in, in the process set off the greatest war that's ever been fought in the Western Hemisphere. Lee gets word of the skirmish and is told that a major Union force is at Gettysburg. Instead of sending a cavalry reconnaissance force to confirm the report, Lee orders his entire army to mobilize. It's a colossal mistake. Lee decides to abandon the original plan. He, he gives up what we call strategic aim, and he, he makes the mistake of, of allowing operational developments to drive strategy. Lee orders all his forces to converge at Cashtown, a small village seven miles from Gettysburg. Sun Tzu would not like his choice, as Cashtown has not been fully scouted. Had Robert E. Lee read Sun Tzu, he would have known better than to proceed on what you think is happening and try to spend the resources to find out what really is happening. Sun Tzu says, move only when you see an advantage and there is something to gain. Only fight if a position is critical. Some 60,000 Confederate troops begin to pour in from nearby Cashtown in Carlisle. 3,000 Union soldiers take position on McPherson Ridge. They try to hold off the onslaught of enemy soldiers until help arrives. But reinforcements are miles away toward Washington, D.C. So the Union soldiers withdraw southeast onto Cemetery Ridge, a range of hills that forms the shape of a fishhook. Cemetery Ridge provides an extremely strong defensive advantage. The terrain is so obvious uh, in favor of the defense that my guess is almost any second lieutenant from West Point would have chosen that ground given the opportunity to do it. When Union General Hancock arrives, he declares it the best natural position he's ever seen. Lee immediately sees the danger of the Union's position. But because Union troops are still straggling in, he believes they are vulnerable. 
Lee then gives an order to Confederate General Ewell that many believe isn't really an order at all. And Lee says to him, attack when you think it's practical. Didn't order.